A nation can survive its fools, and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. about the wars, they've been wrong about jobs, they've been wrong about everything. The question is, are they stupid or do they have a plan? I actually think for the most part, they have a plan, but some are not too smart. Welcome to the Horrible Deplorable Show, the anti-globalist America First program dedicated to de-hoaxing the media and destroying the narrative. Here's your host, the founder and editor of The Daily Stir, Matt Wingard. Welcome to the Horrible Deplorable Show. My name is Matt Wingard, and with me, as always, is my good friend Doris. Hello, Doris. Hello, Matt. Welcome to the Gab community. And this is your friendly reminder that you can listen to this podcast or all of our previous podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Pocket Cast. We put it up on YouTube. You just have to search for the Horrible Deplorable Show, and you will find it. We play on the405media.com on weekdays at 11 a.m. and weekends at 5 p.m. And you can find us on powellmediainc.com, as well as our own website, thedailystir.com. So we had a pretty significant shooting last night down in Florida. It looks like about 17 dead and 50 injured, including a coach. Uh, one of the dead is the coach who, who jumped in front of the some students because no one had a gun to defend themselves. I saw there's a list of the dead, and, you know, we've been, we've been through this a few times, and everybody goes to their camps. The liberals just cannot think of anything else to talk about other than gun control. And so it just becomes a war of words, and within a few weeks, people have sort of moved on to the next thing. There is some reporting today that the shooter had spent some time with a white separatist group of militia of some kind, at least for one day of training. Uh, the leader of that group has said that that happened, and so there may even be a picture of him with a Make America Great Again hat on. So the theory that I have around this is is that when the shooter's a leftist, it gets about two days of coverage and then quickly gets shoved aside to move on to another topic. When it fits the narrative that the garbage mainstream media and the liberal commanding heights want to push, then we're going to get lots of follow-up stories, probably a nice profile on every single person that was within a mile of this shooting over the course of the next month, and they'll just continue to harp on it because they, they sift through these tragedies, looking for the ones that fit their narrative, where the shooter is somebody who they can identify as right-wing or Republican or conservative or what have you, and and then they will hype the heck out of it. And when it's an inconvenience shooter, like the guy who shot the Republican congressman at the baseball field, then within a week, they've pretty much moved on and they don't really like to m mention it very much. And then you have this guy who stabbed some people in Portland, who was actually a Bernie Sanders supporter, but somehow he got morphed into a Trump supporter. And, and that's now the history. Whenever the story gets retold, he's always some alt-right supporter because he'd shown up at some alt-right rally yelling things. He's obviously a mental case, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, if it fits the narrative, it gets hyped. If it doesn't get fit the narrative, it either gets thrown away, you know, put into the memory hole or just simply lied about. These shootings, I mean, especially at schools with children, is it's just awful. And I'm going to give you, I suppose, what the left would say is a conservative take, but I want to have a really straightforward discussion about what can actually be done. Everybody says we have to do something. Okay, well, this is a country with a gun culture, and it has a couple hundred million guns in it. And we've tried an assault rifle ban before. There was one for nearly 10, 10 years in the 90s. It didn't change a thing. It didn't stop shootings. Now, theoretically, if you could ban all guns, you could eventually, at some outdate, get to a place where there might be less gun violence. But remember, in a country with 200 million guns, you know, guns are not like cans of soda. They don't expire after a year or two. Guns can last a long time. If oiled and taken care of, maintained, they can last a long time. So the idea that you're going to move in, say, my lifetime, and I'm middle-aged, that the idea that you're going to move even in a younger person's lifetime to a country that isn't filled with guns is just a fantasy. I mean, you never go around and collect them. I mean, people have made that very clear that I'm just talking about the political realities here. Out of their cold, dead hands, you're not going to collect most of these guns. It's not going to happen in America with the mindset that gun hunters have. Okay, so the reality is, then, that if you're actually struggling for a solution, if you're one of these liberals whose immediate reaction is we have to do something, a gun ban 
will do nothing, even under the best case scenario, within say 40 to 50 years. It would take at least that long for most of the guns to age out. Of course, the reality is that we've had guns in this culture from the very beginning, and we haven't had mass shootings like this. I mean, the machine gun was invented over 100 years ago, and we still didn't get mass shootings until the last few decades. Why? Nobody seems to want to have those much more complicated conversations about the general sense of alienation in our society and the broken homes in our society and the and how distant people feel from each other and the kind of lack of a sense of community and cohesion that can encourage this we don't want to have tough conversations about the fact that we used to institutionalize the mentally ill and i'm not going to make an argument here that that we should return to that policy but the policy of simply mainstreaming and downplaying mental health issues has led to a society in which the mentally ill walk amongst us and are often are, are untreated. And that puts people at jeopardy. And it is a little hard to figure out how you can have a society that's filled with guns and one in which you encourage people who have mental health problems to walk around. I'm not exactly sure how you square that circle. Didn't this guy have postings on Facebook that would have led us to believe that he might be a danger? Well, he was a gun enthusiast, and he had postings that I think you could find a lot of other people posting that probably would not have necessarily rung any bells. He did seem to want to show off and brag about his guns to classmates. They had some concerns about that. I think that definitely is something that should get someone's attention, but it doesn't necessarily... I mean, it, that's... A phenomenon that you would actually find repeated around the country. There was a guy with a YouTube channel about six months ago or so who saw a comment from a guy with this name saying that he aspired to be a professional school shooter. He identified that for the FBI. The FBI's put out a statement saying they looked into it and they couldn't identify where it had come from. They couldn't place it to a person and so they weren't able to pursue it any further. What about, didn't several of the students say they know who it was, even though they hadn't seen him. Well, that's not uncommon at all. We've had this we've had this phenomenon a number of times where there's a shooting and people go, I know exactly who it is. With that, you don't even have to tell me his name. I know who it is. Well, how do we affect that? Well, but you have to have a willingness to intervene, right? If somebody's going to identify, first of all, you're going to get a lot of these. I and mean, if you have a policy of asking people to identify someone who seems a little unhinged or who talks in a troubling way about their guns, you're going to be dealing with thousands of those kinds of scenarios. So you have to have a situation for, and the police often do move in and have conversations, but it, I mean, what do you do if they, if the, if this guy had been identified eight months ago as somebody who was talking about his guns and the police had gone and interviewed him, where would that have gone? He hadn't, he hadn't committed a crime. No, I'm talking about um, students reporting it to their counselors at school. That, that this person might be a problem. So then maybe that person could be chosen to get some extra help. Well, he'd actually been in, uh, suspended. I don't think he was. I think oh, he, that's right. This one was he, suspended. He was moved he? off to an alternative school Yeah. and returned here for the shooting. So again, what is realistic and what is possible, right? What can you actually accomplish? First of all, liberals have created a scenario in which we've collected large numbers of children in one location on a college campus or on a high school, or middle school, elementary school campus. This was a rather large school with a very large student population, and they made them gun-free zones. Now, it's one thing to disarm the children. It's another thing to have a policy that all the adults are going to be disarmed as well. That's an invitation, and you'll notice that these mass shooters don't pick the FBI Academy as a place to go and start a mass shooting. They seldom, if ever, pick an army barracks as a place to go. I mean, there are places where people, other places where people are collected together, but the gun-free zones are the easiest targets. So maybe we should arm the teachers. Well, Judge Napolitano was making that suggestion today, and I have no doubt that the left blogosphere will go absolutely crazy at the idea. And of course, you know, you're dealing with the fact that a lot of the employees in these schools are liberal. So the last thing they want to do is train with a firearm and carry one. But I think you do need two or three people designated to carry a firearm in a school. How have we gotten to the point where we can't trust two or three adults to get training and to carry a firearm on their hip so that they can defend all of these ducklings in a scenario where a mass shooter comes in? 
Banning guns isn't going to get you there in any kind of short window, let alone that it's impossible, let alone that it's unconstitutional. It's not going to get you there. So you have to be willing to have conversations about mental health issues, honest conversations about that, and you're going to have to make hard choices. There are going to be trade-offs in that conversation, but that's not something we do in this society anymore. We don't talk about trade-offs anymore. Well, and part of it is security at the schools. Of course. Uh, in my particular school district, the newest school that was built, you can only get into the office and you have to check in by computer, which takes a photo of you and gives you a name badge before you can get to the classrooms. But most schools can't afford that kind of system. Agreed. I will say this too, and this is the part where I'm gonna get really political. You look at the stubbornness coming from the left. The only answer that they will consider is a complete and total gun ban. And so this is a fever dream of theirs. This is an end goal, but it is a window into the soul of the people we are fighting in this country. Do they want to compromise and find some middle ground that allows us to live together with different sets of values? No, they want a total and complete gun ban. And if that means these school shootings go on because that's the only solution they will settle for, they will not entertain the idea of arming some people at the school. Now, why won't they do that? That's the kind of thing, again, take your ideology out of this. Arming people at the school actually has the potential in the short term to mitigate the problem. You could actually stop shooters. You can save lives. Banning guns or just some guns, assault weapons, isn't going to do that for you. Aren't it's been tried out and it failed. Aren't some schools already having... Sometimes they have safety officers there, but does the environment, are the leftists both inside the school, the employees, and the leftists outside in the political atmosphere, are they encouraging people to say, you know what, you may not like guns, this may not be a comfortable thing for you, but time to buck up, time to learn a skill. The kids need you to be proficient in self-defense, so we need you to do this. No, they have their vision of the world they want, they have decided that they disagree with us, and they will brook no other outcome other than their ultimate goal, which, again, even though I totally disagree with them, even if you tried to give them their goal, a gun-free society in America would take decades. Yeah. How, how many people will die in the process of that? But they will not let go of that one goal. And I'm simply bringing this up to make the point that you can put that out in all of the political battles that we have. The left has one vision for where they want to take this country, and they will brook no compromise there's no sense of, well, we'll have some places with some rules. You know, there's no you know, embrace of federalism or anything like that. They are going to make this country from Maine to Los Angeles, from Florida to Alaska, their vision. And if it takes 100 years, they don't care. So again, it's not that I'm not for compromise. And as I've said repeatedly in this podcast, I would love for there to be a scenario where we can sit down with the leftists in this country and reach accommodation where both sides give a little and we live peaceably with each other. They are the ones that will never allow that, allow that scenario. If you sit down and compromise with them, they will simply take that as, well, we got half from them today, we'll come from the other half tomorrow. The battle is never over for them. They know what they want, and if you give them even a piece of that, there's no settlement. They will simply come back next week and start agitating for more. And unfortunately, this tragedy in Florida is a perfect example of that. There are lots of things that we could do in the short term to try to prevent these kinds of shootings and to mitigate them or end them quickly when somebody who is a potential shooter actually approaches. The left is not interested in those solutions. Well, if I was a parent that had a child in school, I would put pressure on my school to have an armed guard or an armed teacher, someone there that was armed. So this may start at the bottom up at the parent level and not at liberal or conservative level. These are citadels though. I mean, uh, as someone who's worked in the school reform movement for over a decade, you, you would not believe the resistance you will get from the people who feel they own and control the public education system. And while parents may want some people there with guns, there would have to actually be people there willing to carry those guns. And there's a un there are unions you have to overcome and they will resist this. Let's talk about the budget. I want to give an update on, unfortunately, the budget that was passed by the Congress last week. It has huge increases, both for the military and for domestic spending in it. I believe this is the first 
really big affirmative mistake that Congress has made since Trump was elected. Of course, the other mistake they made was not passing the Obamacare repeal, but that was a failure to actually pass something. This is something that they actually had the votes to pass on both sides of the aisle and got it through. Why? Because everyone there loves to spend money. And then the debt, you know, you cannot have these kinds of budget increases and the tax cuts. And I'm a believer that the tax cuts ultimately will lead to more government revenue and that you can bring the deficits down over time. But that doesn't change the fact that you can't also just start spending wildly at the same moment. This is everyone in DC thinking about the short term and their own political goals. All of this, Republicans gave all of this away. Why? Because they wanted a massive increase in military spending. So I have some questions about that. First of all, how do you add $100 billion to the military, which is going to go around and buy up a whole bunch of new material and maybe even expand personnel? How does that not put pressure on us to use that military? We're going to move towards a trillion dollars in military spending and not use this. So for those of us who'd like to see us pull back a little, not retreat to isolationism in the United States, just simply pull back a little, reevaluate some of the places where we've been for over 50 years that are peaceful and start to reassess how we can have a, a slightly lighter footprint in the world and save some money. How does a massive increase in military spending do that? Well, they probably have to replace everything that they bought previously that is now worn out from just sitting there. Sure, but I still say I don't see a world in which these military types are going to have new shiny planes, ships, tanks, boots, weapons, and not be looking for an excuse to use them. I asked on Gab, I did a little poll and asked people if they would prefer, again, because all of this is about the fact that Democrats wouldn't agree to any increase unless it had a commensurate increase in domestic spending. And so because you need 60 votes in the Senate, the Republicans agree to that in order to get the military increases. And this is on top of the increases they already got in the reconciliation from last year. This is another massive increase. I mean, even Corker, who's not somebody I agree with very often, said, I don't know how you spend that kind of money in such a short period of time without a, a bunch of it being wasted. And he's got a point. But I did a poll and I asked people on Gab, which is, I think, you know, any honest person would say leans pretty conservative. And I asked, would you rather cut the budget on both sides, military and domestic, and therefore address our deficit problems, or give away large domestic spending increases in exchange for a military increase. And the poll was split. It was about 50-50 in answer to that question. But I, I say this, you know, first of all, that's not a good issue to advance. If your own side is split 50-50 on it, it's probably not a good idea to move forward. And yet they did. I have a feeling that the people who on the half that were concerned about deficit reduction elevate this as a much bigger priority for them than the other side that simply chose the military spending increase. I think the passion may not be on the deficit hawk side. So this is one of those moments when I start to feel like the GOP is very nearly useless. They couldn't repeal Obamacare and they can't cut budgets. It's getting kind of hard to imagine motivated voters this November when you seem to be giving away the store along the way. You combine this with a high likelihood that Trump will not have made significant progress on the wall, nor deportations by November, and I start to worry about whether or not we can hold on to the House. It looks like the GOP is simply betting on a good economy as being the sole element that motivates voters to choose their candidates over the Democrats. I'm not sure that's a strong enough issue all by itself and not accompanied by something else. Well, included Obamacare in there, not being able to get rid of that. So there's a lot of promises made there that aren't kept. Agreed. So Representative Steve Womack from Arkansas, Republican, just uh, recently became, well, he got the budget gavel on the House side, and he wants to put out a budget blueprint that it cuts entitlements. And he's making these long-winded arguments about how that eats up most of the budget and how we're never going to solve our debt and deficit unless we deal with that. Not that I entirely disagree with that in the long run, but politically, right now, this is stupid. Why? Because he already admits that if they pass this blueprint in the House, in which they will have announced their intention or their desire to do entitlement cuts, the Senate isn't going to do anything. He already admitted he thinks they're going to kick the can down the road. They don't have 60 votes for anything, so they won't even take it up. So that means it's entirely a symbolic vote. He actually acknowledged 
acknowledges that it would be a symbolic vote. Now, I don't know why in the world, heading into tough midterms, you would take a symbolic vote that basically isn't going to register very well with most voters. Seems to me that if, I mean, I have already constantly made the argument on this podcast that I don't believe that entitlement cuts should be the highest priority. But even if I did, those are the kinds of things that are so unpalatable, you better find a way to just do it one day when you have the votes and not signal for three years ahead of time that that's what you intend to do. It's not a good election time strategy. That's just the pure politics of it. Now, secondly, I've never understood why Republicans feel the need to lead with that issue when it comes to budget cuts. They just passed a massive budget increase for the military. How's that going to look to most voters when you feel the need to pump a hundred billion dollars into the military, but you're telling them you're, you're also considering cuts to entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, thing like, things like that. That's not a politically winning strategy. That's just plain stupid. Personally, I've always been of the opinion that, yes, the entitlements are a large segment of the budget, but they're also universally loved. So why not use them as the bludgeon that that gets you the budget cuts you need everywhere else? Republicans are theoretically supposed to be for reducing the size and scope of the federal government. So why not cut the crap out of the budget on the domestic side and reduce the military a little? And I've explained in the past how you can do that by simply reducing the mission. You can still have an extremely strong strong, capable military that can beat the crap out of anybody else on the planet at the levels we were spending last year. But you can cut a little bit from the military, you can cut a lot from the domestic side and simply say, hey, we have to make sure the social security checks keep coming and that Medicare continues to take care of people. Right, folks? So, I mean, it could be this great argument for downsizing the federal government over the course of years or maybe even a decade or two. And then once you've basically hammered the federal government way, way back, Then, ultimately, you could come to voters and say, first of all, you're going to buy yourself a whole bunch of extra time for the entitlements before they hit a crisis point. But eventually, you'd get there. And you can say, hey, look, we've run out of options. Now we have to start addressing this. But it gives you, it seems to me, the entitlements and their growing share of the budget gives you an excuse if you were a limited government representative. It gives you an excuse with voters to cut other aspects of the budget. Why are we paying for NPR? Why are we paying for other people's abortions? The list goes on and on of things you could cut. Why are we adding more and more monuments and federal land to the government when we need to make these entitlement payments? Now, of course, that's what you'd do if you were a limited government representative. I suspect we have very few of those actually in the Congress. So on the subject of the military, I'm going to wade into a subject that I think may tick a lot of you off, but I ask you to keep an open mind and simply Ask yourself if this is true. One of the things you have to do in politics is ask yourself what's possible with the voters that I have. And I believe in incrementalism. The left certainly believes in that. They've done that for 100 years. But what are the trends? What can you actually get done with the votes that you actually have? And when it comes to our military posture, you know, we have these bases in South Korea. We spend a lot of money there projecting the idea that if North Korea were to do anything, we would be there to, and we've made promises to South Korea. We have bases in Japan to do the same thing. We have bases in Germany and the rest. Now, does anybody actually think that we would get involved in a land war in South Korea? Korea. Does anybody think that we would get involved in a significant shooting war with the Chinese? You know, I'm talking about a military engagement in which tens of thousands of American soldiers would be killed. I think we've run that scenario in Iraq. And what we know about our fellow citizens, whether we like it or not, is that they don't really have the stomach for prolonged war and for mounting casualties on the American side. I believe the Iraq war proved that America can no longer sustain a prolonged military engagement in a foreign land. As a country, and this isn't true, I'm sure, of many of you, dear listeners, but as a country, on the whole, we don't have the will for large-scale sacrifice when it comes to overseas issues. I think if this country were invaded, if it were something that were existential for us, absolutely, I still think Americans would rise to the occasion. But to go overseas and fight on behalf of the South Koreans or the Japanese or the Germans or Eastern Europe or, in this case, the Iraqis, no, I I think we've run that scenario. And it's clear that Americans are willing to sacrifice a little, but very little. And we very quickly reached those points in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And the American people don't want to do it. Now, I think that's just a true statement. You don't have to like it to recognize that it's true. Now, what else is true? Our friends know that. Our enemies know that. 
It's an indisputable fact. So now what? We're never going to really defend Japan, South Korea, the Ukraine, and Germany. Russia knows this. China knows this. North Korea knows this. So why are we spending money building a military that we're never going to use? Spending money for defensive asymmetrical warfare? Things like drones and stuff like that. Yes, I get that. Homeland defense? Yes. But we've built an awful lot of ships and planes for basically wars overseas that we're never going to fight. This is an unpleasant truth, but it's a truth nonetheless. And again, I get the deterrent factor that part of this is, you know, you flex your muscle and you achieve peace and people negotiate with you because they want to avoid war with you. But they have to believe that you'll go to a war with them. And I don't think that any of our adversaries actually believe that. The Russians don't think we're going to go to war in Eastern Europe for them. Now they know we'll sell weapons. We may even plant nuclear weapons in certain places. You know, we'll do strategic things, but we're never actually going to get involved in a massive campaign. I mean, if the Russians rolled across Ukraine, we're not going to do anything about that. We're not going to suddenly airlift a million men and material, American soldiers there, to try to push the Russians out of Ukraine. Everybody knows that, and you can continue to repeat that scenario around the world to make my point. The fact of the matter is, is that once a civilization, a country, a society like America has gotten to the point where it's not willing to do those things, and everyone knows it, you've got some very hard questions to ask yourself. This is about how an empire pulls back. Now, we've watched this. We have historical knowledge of the Romans in this scenario. The British have had to do this just in the last 100 years. Is there a graceful way for an empire to pull back? Not retreat, not become isolationist, but simply to strategically pull back. I would submit that the reason why you don't see a lot of successes in that vein is because it is very difficult to do. There's a lot of things you give up. It's expensive to project your strength around the world, but it has benefits. It projects power, and it makes our elites in the United States the most powerful and influential elites in the world. Countries like Germany, Japan, France, Australia, the UK, they have to listen to us, mostly because they depend on us, ultimately, militarily. And it comes with some economic benefits as well. And it's also, and this is somewhat unquantifiable, it's a source of pride internally. It's a part of a country's character. And people are loathed to feel like they're retreating in any way because they have to process that as a blow to national pride in some way or another. But you see, in order to actually be an empire that projects your force out of the world, you have to be willing to back that up with credible force. I think everyone in the world still believes that we'll do short-term things. But a full-on war to protect our allies, no one believes that. So we're just wasting money. Think of us as part of a committee in which we are the president of that committee. So we get to sit in a prominent seat and everyone has to listen to us. If we were to pull back a little in the world, it, it would mean that we would basically not have that special chair, but we would still be sitting in the front row with all the other big dogs. However, if we continue down this path fiscally and we allow our credit rating to decline, and I've tried to express this before, this is far more more dangerous a path than some slight re retreat or pullback in the world militarily. Yes, that comes with risks. That absolutely comes with risks. But continuing on this fiscal path has a much, much greater risk. Here's the difference. If we were to pull back and then problems flared up in the world, we could always project ourselves back out there again. We proved in World War II that we can rev up pretty quickly for full-fledged warfare. I mean, we have tremendous capacity in this country to build the infrastructure for war. Within a matter of a year or two, we could be right back where we wanted to be. Now, that would come at the cost of lives. Absolutely, it would take sacrifice to get back to that position. But it could be done, and it can be done in a relatively short period of time. If we continue on this fiscal path, and ultimately our credit rating declines, and we get into any kind of a crisis. The, the history is very clear on this. No one recovers quickly from that. That is a real blow to your economy, to the prestige of your monetary value, and you don't bounce back. Best case scenario, it takes a few decades. Places like Argentina still haven't managed to come back from fiscal decline. If you debase your currency and your credit rating and your credit worthiness to the point where the world moves on essentially and turns somewhere else, they don't come back. And so that is the kind of existential threat, in my mind, that is much more significant than any individual military threat. 
And as conservatives, if we're ever going to bring the budget down, we are going to have to be willing to look at the military side. There is no way the domestic side of expenditures will ever come down if we aren't willing to at least look at the military side. That's just the reality of where we are in this country. We're never going to have some kind of supermajority where we can take domestic spending down by 80% and military spending up by 80%. That will never happen. That scenario can never ever happen. What we do in the world is just too expensive for us right now. We have to find a way to pull back to some degree and to find cost savings. We just have to. Let me give you another scenario. Imagine that you were part of a family that had $25 million. It was worth $25 million. And everybody lived a really nice lifestyle. And then through a setback or some kind of a market change, suddenly the family only has fifteen million dollars in net worth now you have two choices in that scenario you can either look around at your lifestyle and make some modest cuts and the family fortune will stay at fifteen million and may actually one day grow back to twenty five million or you can all keep pretending that you still have twenty five million dollars in wealth and spending accordingly what will happen then is your fifteen million dollars will become twelve become ten become everybody will basically ignore the reality and live high on the hog for today until it's all gone that's the scenario that has to be avoided history does not favor the aging empire we can only beat those odds by being honest with ourselves and aggressively making change procrastination is our enemy Hysteria update. The Me Too movement is now into, I don't know, about six, what is it, about six months it's been going on now. I have refrained from suggesting that we're in any, any kind of final phase because I don't think we are close to a final phase. We might be. We might be in the early stages of the phase where this burns itself out, but we'll see. I, I think it's got some more scalps to take along the way. I saw that they're banning grid girls in the UK. Grid girls are essentially the models, apparently darts, professional darts is an actual sports and uh, sport and there are girls beautiful models that come out and hold signs or do things and then at the formula one races there are beautiful girls that are about that hold up signs or do something much like in the united states we have girls at ufc matches or boxing matches that hold up the round card and that announces which round it is and those kinds of things well they've banned those in the uk and of course it you know unemploys all those women but see to the angry lesbian feminist it's important that if there's a beautiful woman out there who has some advantage over her then of course that advantage needs to be taken away and since that's not an employment opportunity for any angry lesbian feminist then it shouldn't be an opportunity for someone else and of course they're all being used what have you although i saw extensive interviews with these gals who were delighted to have this job love doing it in interacting with the crowd, and they were mortified that this opportunity had been taken away from them. It's essentially a war on modeling, and I think you can expect all of that to come to the United States. It will get here shortly. I saw that Sports Illustrated turned over their entire swimsuit issue and the shooting to women. So the photographers are going to be women, all the editors, everyone who's making a decision about the swimsuit issue is female. They don't want any men involved with it at all. That's pretty smart, a smart a Sports Illustrated, really. We'll see. Although, if you're trying to sell it to men, I mean, is it women that they're expecting to buy the magazine? You're assuming that this wi that women are going to make it um, less sexy, but I'm not sure they will. Well, we'll find out. I mean, they're not making this change because it wasn't selling. So all of this is a war on masculinity, which I find amusing in a dark way. So like not amusing because the statistics in this country for boys are far worse than they are for girls. Far worse. The drug use rates, you know, they're involved in crime, all the rest. I think a backlash is coming. This isn't a real movement. It's really just a, a man-hating movement for angry lesbians. And unless it addresses two other issues, unless the Me Too movement addresses two other issues, because, you know, they're focused on the sort of aggressive male type and women feeling uncomfortable in the workplace, sexual overtures that go awry or are not wanted. But all of that, that issue of workplace sexuality and, and the interplay between men and women, it has other facets to it, right? One is the fact that women do use their sex to get advancement. Not all women, just like not all men, are involved in uh, aggressively hitting on women. But this idea that women do use their sexuality for their own purposes, that kind of, if you actually had to talk about it, that would kind of mitigate and cloud some of these stories you hear. Not about the horrible actors like Weinstein, but some of these other stories in which it's just one or two women accusing a man of something, right? The other thing is, turns out that women are human beings and that there's a vengeful, angry nature to some women. And when 
they have not received what they wanted, this can be used as a tool. The fact that you've simply invited them to come forward on a warlock hunt is an invitation for bitter people to exact revenge. This isn't because they're women, it's because they're people. I disagree that it's all angry feminists or angry lesbians that are fueling this thing. I think just a lot of plain old women are also behind the Me Too movement. However, they're not going to like the results. Because in my opinion, the results are going to be that men quit asking women on dates. Well, in case I wasn't clear, I, I think that the driving force behind this is angry lesbians. That doesn't mean that there aren't lots of heterosexual women that are involved or who are accusing, but there are key people with in positions of power who are writing the articles, who are running down the stories. And, and I've tried to explain this before. If you actually spent time in some of these major newsrooms or major networks and met the producers and the reporters, you would find very quickly that they're not a cross-section of the United States. They're hard lefties. They're basically all of those college professors you knew that were hardcore lefties with a camera or a computer. These are hard-bitten folks with an agenda. And, you know, you just see their profile page or their picture on their Twitter account, and they seem like a nice enough person. That is not who they are. And the kinds of people you know, the kind of people you interact, don't have those jobs and aren't setting that agenda. So lots of average people are caught up in these kinds of mob actions when they happen. But I'm describing the people who are the driving force behind them, the ones that keep throwing kerosene on it. And just as an example. So the other day, Sean White, who is a very talented snowboarder, won the gold medal again in the Winter Olympics. How did I find this out? Because I was scrolling through my feed and a mainstream news outlet had a headline that said, Sean White wins gold in the midst of his sexual harassment controversy. So I had to click on that and find out what the heck they were talking about. And it turns out he had some band that he was a part of, or may still have a band. And a few years back, this is a couple of years ago, some woman in the band, the drummer or something, came forward and said that he had sexually harassed her, or that he'd shown her pornographic content. And I thought to myself, oh, yeah, I know what it was. The line was that he'd forced her to view pornographic content. And I thought to myself, how do you force somebody to watch pornographic content? content. Is that something out of A Clockwork Orange where she had like her, she was tied to a chair and she had her eyelids forced open with clips? And then, you know, I mean, she says that he was graphic with her. Okay. I don't know whether that's true, but one person in your life two years ago claiming that he, she wasn't claiming he raped her. She wasn't even claiming that he physically attacked her. She just had what she thought were some unpleasant conversations with him. That was enough to taint his gold medal for this mainstream news outlet. They had to run a headline announcing that he'd won the gold and mention two-year-old allegations of a sexual nature that had nothing to do with anything physical. That's where we are. This very talented athlete who'd done something extraordinary had to have that bucket of crap thrown on him on one of the best days of his life. That's, I think, emblematic of where this movement is. The media never learn from their mommies that if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Well, they feed on negative information, so they almost wouldn't be able to put out a newspaper if it was if they were following that edict. You mean a good news newspaper? Yeah, people have tried that. It doesn't sell, sadly, human nature being what it is. All of which brings me to the point I want to make about all the static you're seeing and the civil war that's developing between both sides. And I've tried to address this in, in previous podcasts. I know how uncomfortable it is when things get this heated between both sides. It's actually those of us on the right side, in general, who get more uncomfortable than the left side. A lot of people on the left are very happy to be in an agitated state, very happy to be fueled by hate and anger. They feed on that. They love it. It's, it's their daily meal. But I'm here to tell you that there is no turning back now. With the election of Donald Trump and everything that's going on, the fact that the left has become unglued and unhinged, we have kicked a hornet's nest with the liberals, and there's no going back. This, unfortunately, is a death match, and they absolutely intend to fight Donald Trump every step of the way, and not just him, everything that he's talking about that we believe in, everything. And whether he makes it four years or eight years, they will never stop trying to retcon the history. What's retcon? So reconditioning, retconning, is when you essentially tell people something happened in the past that feeds your narrative. So because people from the past are dead and gone, and everyone doesn't necessarily know exactly what happened, you if you write the history books, you can simply say, 
here's what happened and here's what it meant. I mean, you have Howard Zinn that wrote this book, which the left loves, called The History, the People's History of the United States. And it's just basically a communist manifesto, taking every historical event in the United States and couching it in Marxist terms, and explaining to people why it's all been about class struggle and what an evil country we've been from day one. That's retconning. When people moved to tear down Civil War statues, that's retconning. Removing the history so that it's as if it didn't exist, as if it didn't happen. Either removing or rewriting, apparently. They will never stop trying to retcon the history of Donald Trump or trying to run him down. Believe me, long after he's gone, those of us who were alive when it happened, we're going to be battling this idea of that there was this racist in the White House and that he loved white supremacists and that he hated black people. Oh, and that he was a misogynist who used to beat women. Yeah, they'll make that claim. I mean, they'll say whatever. And the more, the further we get from the event, and remember, they're the ones that fill, that run the schools, right? So they get all of these six, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds who don't know who Donald Trump was. He was long dead before they were born. But they're going to be listening to all those nice liberal teachers tell them who Donald Trump was. And exactly how do you think that's going to be framed? Based on what you're hearing from them right now with him standing there and us pushing back on their lies. We're having a lot of success pushing back on their lies right now because everybody can see the truth. But once all the players are dead and gone and they're still lying, what happens then? I was listening to Dave Chappelle, pretty funny guy. I was listening to one of his stand-ups on Netflix. And when he started talking about Trump, kind of wasn't very funny, frankly. And But I find that he isn't that liberal. He's just not as deranged in his attacks the way that some on the left are. But at some point, he started talking about how he was energized. This whole episode with Trump had energized him. And he's never felt more American than when he and everyone in the audience were hating Trump together. I think... It's worth considering that, that you know, that they, they may be on their heels and they may feel like they're losing at this moment, but they're never going to stop coming and pushing back. And they will never stop trying to turn this into an aberration in trying to color this as the, the dark night of America's past, where we went through a decade or so of racism and misogyny before we got back on track and the arc of history began bending again in the right direction. So in the long run, this is either going to go down as a moment in which we turned the corner and managed to start reestablishing some basic principles in this country again, or it'll be the moment that they'll remember as the victors when they got super energized to double, triple, quadruple down on their progressive push and marginalize us forever. It can only be one or the other. I subscribe to the Mr. Miyagi principle, who said very famously, Daniel Son, walk on right side, okay. Walk on left side, okay. Walk down middle, get squished. Romney is apparently going to announce any moment that he's running. Don't do it, Utah. I saw that the state chair came out and said that he shouldn't run, that he doesn't really even live there. His children were born in Utah. He didn't raise them in Utah, and that he shouldn't be representing the people of Utah. You can do better, Utah. So there was a poll that came out that says m more U.S. voters would pick a Republican congress congressional candidate than a Democrat, marking it the first time in three months that the GOP has led in the generic ballot. Now, I follow news feeds a lot, and I can tell you that when the generic ballot was pro-Democrat and the gap was getting larger, they were putting a story out every day, every day, about the generic ballot and, and the coming wave in November. I saw one story <laughs> that I happened to catch on this poll saying that Republicans now lead it. Polls are often used to simply push an agenda. But I do think it's interesting that the numbers on the generic ballot have moved in the last month when Democrats tried to shut down the government over illegal aliens and were having a massive debate about immigration and the wall. Hmm, there could be a message there to the GOP about how to win in November. That, of course, is assuming that they want to win. I saw that Colorado is considering a purple card, not a green card, but a purple card to allow illegals to work in the state of Colorado. And California, of course, has passed some laws threatening to punish local law enforcement or businesses that cooperate with ICE. This is all very states' rights, isn't it? It's kind of interesting because I, I, I seem to have this memory just a few years ago of the state of Arizona passing a law that required local law enforcement to work with ICE and to ask for IDs in, in order to help identify illegals and get them deported. Everyone on the left came unglued. That actually was taken all the way to the Supreme Court under lawsuit because the left said, 
It is absolutely fundamentally inappropriate for a state to take on a federal issue like immigration that should be left to the federal government. Now we have a president who'd like to use the federal government to enforce those laws and deport lots of people. And now suddenly it's perfectly okay for California to get involved in immigration enforcement or essentially to prevent immigration enforcement. And it's perfectly reasonable for Colorado to consider actually handing out green cards, which they'll call purple cards, to illegal aliens. It's the 360 degree tactics that I have described many times on this podcast. Podcast. The Democrats do not have a principle of states' rights or federalism. It is just a will to power. And so, when their guy is running the federal immigration system and weakening it and hobbling it and making sure that it doesn't actually do their job, then they're all for, fe for the federal government being in control and poo-poo any states that would try to get involved to do anything. The moment the tables are turned and a conservative is in charge of the apparatus for deportation and he is ramping that up to deport lots of people, now suddenly that's terrible and it's perfectly acceptable for states to get involved in trying to prevent immigration enforcement. And this is the way it's always going to be with them. They do not have a principle. This is how they can appear to be all aghast in the Me Too movement, at aggressive men who take advantage of women. And yet, they protected Bill Clinton throughout the entire 90s, who was accused of rape, who Kathleen Wiley had said, thrown her up against the bookcase in the Oval Office, had an affair with an intern, and you had liberals saying that they'd get down on their knees and they would service him as long as he protected abortion, right? Because it was the politics that mattered, not whether or not this guy was an ogre with women. They do not have a shred of principle inside of them. I know they're having a debate right now in the Senate that Mitch McConnell had promised they would have over DACA. Looks like none of the four amendments, which are essentially different bills, different versions of immigration reform, I don't think any of them can get to 60. The one that will probably get the closest may come within one or two votes of getting 60 is this Schumer bill that's a complete giveaway. And you have like eight Republicans that are going to join that bill, which gives you the temperature of the Senate. I think it's a good idea to have everybody take these votes, though. I mean, if you can get these 10 Democrats in red Trump states to take these awful votes, and then, and this is the critical second part of that, if you can actually recruit a good candidate on the Republican side who is an immigration restrictionist and draw a sharp contrast, you've now got them on the record taking these abysmal votes. I think you actually, under that scenario, have a shot at, six, at winning 60 votes in the Senate. I think you can defeat nearly every single one of these red state Democrat senators if you can A, get them to take these terrible votes for massive illegal immigration in the country, but at the same time, you actually have to recruit an immigration restrictionist as your Republican candidate. On the DACA issue, I noticed that two judges, two different judges now, have blocked the expiration of DACA next month, which means that the program must continue while it winds its way through the courts. This is going to take this issue probably through the election. I'm not that worried about it, though, because I think this, the Supreme Court is going to rule in the president's favor on this. So the moment they rule, and that'll be somewhere six to eight months after March, the moment they rule, DACA's over instantaneously and the deportations can begin. So I think both sides want to save this issue and battle it out on the election, but the fact that the courts, all these activist judges have put an injunction on the DACA expiration is only going to buy them a few months. Even if the Democrats were to win the House, that doesn't change the fact that DACA will expire and the president runs the immigration deportation system known as ICE. So when the Supreme Court decides that DACA is illegal and we have to deport these people, can we deport the judges along with them? It'd be nice. So Obama and his wife displayed their presidential portraits this week. They are absolutely atrocious. I know most of you have seen them. If you haven't, take a look. And I think the best way to view them is with all of the other presidential portraits. And I know some people put some mosaics together. It's just, first of all, it's amateurish. It's not a very good likeness of either one of them. It looks like basically a high school student was asked to paint paint these paintings. The president is sitting on a chair surrounded by a bunch of green leaves. And when you look at all of the other presidential portraits, it's just a hideous ju juxtaposition. The painter who did this has, has a history of painting violent anti-white pictures with blacks holding the severed heads of whites. Like anybody could have gotten away with that if it was reversed. And he apparently is known for actually putting, pardon me, but I'm going to just have to say this because it's the truth. He actually uses his own sperm in the paintings. He likes to put that in there. Just fantastic choices for Obama. I think it's a colossal cock-up. Ugly. It is interesting, though, to look at that painting as a marker 
of who was, everybody wants to say that Trump is this radical departure. But you look at those presidential pictures against all of the other presidential pictures and tell me that Barack Obama wasn't the radical departure. And not because he's black. He could have stood there in a suit and had a painting painted like everyone else. He said he had some crazy avant-garde painting of himself made that isn't even a good likeness. You know, and it's, it's a poor decision because as time goes on and your presidency recedes, one of the few things people have of you is that painting. That's the thing that's going to be sitting in the National Mall. I don't know. I bet he replaces it sometime in the future. I don't think so. This month is the birthday of Lincoln and Washington. I still remember when I was working for a congressman and they flew me out to D.C. It was my very first time in D.C. We got there at night and they put me up in a hotel that was very near the house side of Congress. So I was very near the mall. Must have gotten back from the airport and gotten checked in and by like nine o'clock. It was very late and it was cold. It was a, I think it was March. But I put on my coat and I was just too buzzing. You know, I was in D.C. and I could see the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument lit off in the distance and I just, I had to go see him. Now, it's a lot further down the mall from one end to the other than you think. So, in the cold, it took a while, but boy, the Lincoln Memorial was majestic, especially at night and seeing it that way for the first time. There's this, they use some beautiful soft yellow lighting in there on the stone and it's, it, he it just, it's a temple. It just, it just feels like a temple. And when you walk in there, his two greatest speeches, the Gettysburg Address and the second inaugural address are on opposite sides of the wall. And so you can walk over to one and read it and then turn and look at the man himself and then walk over to the other one and read it. And it's moving. It's really a moving experience. And it, I think it is the most beautiful monument in Washington and a tribute to um, an incredible human being. Sadly, demoted to the second greatest president in although I think he competes with Washington for greatest president ever. But if we're talking just about Republican presidents, unfortunately, he has recently been demoted to second place because, of course, the greatest Republican president ever elected is Donald Trump. And then the, when I think of George Washington, our founding father and first president, probably the story that jumps out at me the most was from 1783, shortly after the Revolutionary War had been won. Congress had been very, very, this was the Continental Congress, had been very, very bad about feeding and clothing them all throughout the war. It had been a constant struggle for Washington to get them to equip his army. And there was a lot of frustration in the officer corps. And there started to be grumblings because officers weren't getting paid. And it kind of looked like Congress was just going to renege on that. Everybody was sort of glad the war was over and was moving on. And they weren't being paid what they had been promised. And talk of an insurrection had begun to circulate. And Washington found out, and he called his officers together in Newburgh, New York. This was March 15, 1783. And they were all there waiting for him, men who had served with him, some for a year or two, some for many years, through vicious winters and horrible battles. And they had seen a lot, a lot of death and destruction together. And they were all waiting for him. And he comes in and sits down, and he begins to impress upon them that this is a mistake, what they're talking about, and that it should not go forward. And then at one point, he decides he wants to read them a letter. And so he pulls this letter out from his breast pocket and opens it and stops, realizing he actually can't read it, and reaches into his coat again for a pair of glasses. And as he's about to put them on, he hesitated, and he looked at the officers looking at him, this aging general, having to use his glasses, and he says, Gentlemen, you must pardon me. I have grown old in the service of my country and now find that I am growing blind. Apparently, everybody basically began crying because they realized that nobody had made more sacrifices than General Washington. He'd been there from the very beginning throughout the entire eight years, and he'd seen it all. And he managed to make them feel quite, quite small and petty in that moment. And the whole idea of an insurrection absolutely dissipated like ether in that moment. Happy birthday, Abraham Lincoln and General George Washington. That's about all the time we have for this show. But again, you can listen to this episode and past episodes on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, YouTube, and on our website, thedailystir.com. This is a labor of love, but we need your support. We need you to share this show with others in order to grow. Trump supporters, you are not alone. 
Goodbye, Doris. Goodbye, Matt.